everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to Click3D. This is the program where we talk about 3D technologies like laser scanning and photogrammetry. We also talk about hardware and software and occasionally we get to interview some people who are doing some really cool stuff using 3D technologies. Now today what I thought I would do is look at Cloud Compare and more specifically their animation plugin. A lot of people don't know that they have this cool little feature where if you have a model and you import it into Cloud Compare, you can actually create a really nice animation. If so, if it's a small little model or even if it's like a large scene with like point cloud data, you can absolutely animate and fly through it and stuff like that. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. But before I do that, what I need to do is start at the beginning. So before you get started and before you know you start on your animation journey you obviously need some kind of a 3d model so that could be with laser scanning it could be with photogrammetry it could be with a number of different technologies nowadays there's even your iphone has a little lidar scanner built into it so um, there's a lot of different options that people have but if you know ahead of time that you're going to be doing an animation then there's some things that you can do beforehand that will help you so these are the kinds of things that i'm going to be talking about just very very briefly now um, I've talked about some of these in greater detail in some of my other videos. So if you look through there, uh, you'll find a bunch of stuff there. But let's talk about first uh, capturing your 3D data. So the first one I'm going to talk about is laser scanning. So when it comes to laser scanning, um, that's a type of instrument which, well, it has limited options. Okay, so um, a lot of laser scanners don't have good uh, photo quality unless it uses an external camera okay so some now for example the Ferro Focus S350 or the S series um, set of scanners will adapt to a 360 camera and uh, for example a Regal scanner will adapt with a digital SLR camera that's externally mounted so you get the full power of a digital SLR so that's super helpful but other things uh, are for example uh, the density of the data so when you're capturing a laser scan, uh, for whatever reason, um, how dense those points are may be helpful to you. So you don't want to capture a roadway at a very, very low resolution and then find that you're trying to fly around or put the camera in certain places where there's just a lot of empty space or just a lot of space between the points. So density is important. And as a result, um, your camera positions or where you're putting the scanner is important as well often with the uh, with the laser scanner it's a line of sight instrument so let's say for example I have a tree and stuff like that or things or objects in front of me if I just scan at one position and I know that I move to the other side I'm just gonna see empty space because anything that's behind the object that I scan is gonna have a hole no data so I may want to fill in all those positions especially if I'm gonna be flying around there with some additional scanner positions so the general rule of thumb here is that if you're going to be doing this for an animation it's better to actually have more scan positions than it is to just increase your resolution high resolution with fewer scan positions is not really all that helpful because you're still going to see the holes granted you'll have more data where you do see it but if you just have holes everywhere it's not going to look that attractive now i talked about color and exposure so uh, if you have the option, for example, for high dynamic range on a lot of these scanners, which currently do, this is super helpful, right? So you're going to get the right color uh, and you'll pick up color where, for example, if something is overexposed or underexposed, it'll help to bring those extreme values or those extreme exposures into um, a better, uh, I shouldn't say view, but um, it'll have them in the correct exposure. Okay, so that's really the bottom line there. Uh, there are some different... Uh, settings that can be used in terms of exposure but even sometimes on hand scanners and things like this there's little sliders and such that you can adjust so ensuring that you're going to be uh, getting the best color data possible is uh, really important well I already talked about the scanner positions but one thing I didn't talk about is if you're outdoors it's really helpful to elevate your scan position so if you're doing a roadway uh, it does a couple of things so one thing is that you by uh, lifting the scan position up you get more points on the ground right so if we took an extreme situation where the scanner was very very low to the ground let's say it was just like you know 30 centimeters or something off the ground you can't scan 
the ground or the roadway far away. And what happens is there's no laser return. It just kind of goes off. It bounces and reflects off. It, the angle is just too shallow. So raising your camera position up will allow you to collect more points and give you a slightly different perspective. Now, the second thing that it does too is you'll know that, for example, with laser scanning, if you're scanning trees or you have edges of objects that have the sky as a background, there's often color bleed. So the background gray or blue sky or whatever uh, will sometimes bleed onto the corners of these objects. And this is very common with trees. So if you have a high scan position, basically you're raising the horizon. And so what you'll find is that the higher you go, that position where you get color bleed will change as well. So you'll get more uh, data from trees and leaves uh, that are not um, you know, getting this false color. So that will be helpful as well. Now, photogrammetry is a big one, and I've uh, covered a whole bunch of stuff on this in some of my previous Click 3D videos. So please go back and uh, have a look at some of these. But basically, there's three things that really matter with your camera settings in order to get proper exposure. And one of them is going to be your uh, actual shutter speed. The other one is going to be your ISO setting. And the other one is going to be your... Um, your aperture setting okay so those three things are the, the three important uh, settings that will give you the best possible photo now sometimes like I said before with the scanner you can use HDR or you can use some other things as well to your advantage but of course lighting is very important and if you have an object where you have control of the lighting that is super helpful so keep that in mind whenever you're going to be using photogrammetry for this type of thing now in both the case of laser scanning and photogrammetry, a lot of the software packages have editing features. So um, one of them might be texture adjustments. So you might be able to play with some sliders, especially in photogrammetry packages. Uh, for example, Artec Studio, uh, they have some sliders where you can do some gamma, contrast, brightness adjustment, and that's going to be really helpful, get you the best possible texture as possible. Sometimes with the scanner software, for example, in Ferrocene and even other scanning software, you can filter out data. So if there's a lot of stray points or like noisy points or whatever, there are ways to um, filter these out, including uh, removing just unwanted areas. So if there's an area beyond a doorway or something that I just don't want to have, um, you can just crop those out, cut them out, delete them, or even just hide them. Okay, so preparing, capturing your data and preparing it properly properly is going to be really important when you're going to be creating a visualization. Let's talk about how we're going to be presenting the data. And so what I mean here is, let's say, for example, you've already scanned, you got your data. How is it going to be presented to you in the viewport? So it's just sitting there and, and what kinds of things uh, can you see? Well, the first thing is with 3D data, you often have the option to change what you're seeing. So uh, typically we want to see the uh, RGB data or the color data, which is great, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's more important to see, for example, the intensity data, or you can do things like height ramps to see, you know, you'll color something red that's really high and something blue that's really low. And that can be helpful as well. So understanding the way that you are going to present this is going to be helpful. Also the density of scan data. So some uh, software programs will not load up all the data at once. Okay. So what they do is they might filter out or when you're moving, it may, um, it may what's called decimate or, or do something where it reduces the number of points just to help increase performance. So have a look at that in your software package, depending on what it is that you're using, um, because it can be helpful. There's also some things uh, on gap filling, for example. So in Ferrocene, there's an option to do gap filling. So if you don't have a really great density, or for example, you've subsampled the point cloud, so you've reduced the total number of points, you can uh, do something where, for example, it'll take a point and another point and then try to fill the gap in between. Uh, and that's, that can be kind of helpful. You can also adjust point size. Point size is very, very common in a lot of software packages and uh, you know it'll help to look uh, make the point cloud or make the data look uh, a little bit more dense. Now there's other effects too. For example, there's a type of x-ray view or sometimes there's like false lighting and things like that that you can put on. So have a look at those too. Sometimes they may or may not be helpful. But one of uh, the big ones for sure is going to be your background color. 
And sometimes people just don't think about it or they just use, um, you know, whatever is there uh, or they'll stick like an image in the background that it's got some, I don't know, sky or, or uh, some kind of an outdoor scene or whatever, which may or may not help you. And it really depends on what it is that you are capturing and what it is you want to present. So let's say, for example, you have an outdoor scene. You may want to have a cloud or a blue sky or something like that. And then as you fly around it, you kind of see that. So some software packages will give you that particular option. But in other cases, you may want to remove that completely. You may want people to focus just on the model or the point cloud data. And in that case, you want something that isn't as distracting. Okay, so you may you may not want to place a gradient. Uh, you may want to not want to have like weird colors. Uh, black is a really good color to start with. And the reason is laser scanners in particular don't scan dark, dark, dark black surfaces very well. So the chances of you having a lot of black points is usually pretty low. So often when you have a black background uh, as your sort of uh, uh, your, your, your overlay, I shouldn't say your overlay, but your background and your point cloud in front of that, that's usually pretty good. Now, in the case of a photogrammetry model that captures colors maybe a lot better, you may want to change that. So you may want to have a white background or a gray background. So just keep that in mind uh, whenever you're going to be presenting these things. Another one that is very common in a lot of different software has to do with orthographic versus perspective. And what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to open up Cloud Compare and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Oh, there is one more thing actually, and I just forgot, and that has to do with the field of view. So I'm actually going to be showing these two things, the orthographic versus perspective, and then the effect of field of view. So let's go over to Cloud Compare. Okay, so we're in the Cloud Compare interface, and all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create a very, very simple object that should give you the uh, idea. So I'm just going to create a box. I'm going to create that. So this is uh, just a very simple uh, cube. And from this, what we're going to do is look at this differently or in different ways. So right now, I'm in perspective view. So if you look at this, you'll see that um, the top here is a little bit bigger than the bottom, okay? Or the parts that are farther away are a little bit smaller than the parts that are in front of us. And so these perspective lines sort of become smaller as you go far away. So these are like vanishing lines and that sort of thing. So this is the way people see. And so it's a very natural way to present the model or whatever it is that you're doing. Now there is a way to change that and um, one is through the field of view but before I do that I'm just going to use the default setting here. So there's orthographic and perspective. Okay now there's two types of perspective but they're kind of the same but I'm going to choose orthographic now. Okay so we're just on object-centered perspective. If I go to orthographic you'll see that this cube starts to look a little funny and the reason is an orthographic projection gives you all the sides sort of in an equal dimension. And so it looks a little strange when you're looking at it. It's not very clear to the eye what is going on here. Now, orthographic projections are used in, for example, engineering or sometimes in engineering drawings. So they can be useful, but they're not that useful for presenting an animation. If you really want to impress people, usually this is not the way to go. So make sure that you're an object centered perspective. And that's what I've got here. Now, there is a way to sort of go between, for example, a very, very high perspective, wide field of view to something which is more orthographic. And you have to be careful of that. And there are ways or advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, if I go to the camera settings here, uh, if you look down in this area right now, I'm at about 50 degrees. OK, so this is kind of a normal uh, field of view. But if I change this to something that's really wide, so let's say I go to something like 180 degrees and I'm just going to click OK. And let me see if I can get this in here. Actually, it's so wide that it even disappears. But let me try something and get this into, uh, into view here. Actually, that's even too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that back down to about 120. Okay, so we're actually inside the box now. So I need to get back and zoom out on this. There we go. So you'll see what the problem is here. This looks highly, highly distorted. So this is 120 degrees. It's very, very wide. It doesn't look that great. So as I rotate this around, it just kind of looks weird to the eye. It's too stretched, right? The perspective is, is just too much here. So you need to keep this in mind. And I have seen videos where people do this before, and it just doesn't look all that appealing.
Now there is a case where you may want a wider field of view and that is when you're inside of a small space. So if you have a photogrammetry model that's inside of a small room or, or a laser scanner or point cloud and you're in a small room, you may want to see more. So if you have 50 degrees, you may not see as much of the point cloud as you want. And as you try to back the camera out to see more, you end up just breaking through or passing through another wall. So in order to be inside of a room and still capture or have a wide field of view, you need to change the uh, setting that's over here. So this is the, uh, the 120, you know, you move it up, you can be 90, 100, you can test it out and see what works for you. I'm going to go back to 50 because uh, we're just dealing with this particular model here and in cloud compare, but these things are important. So orthographic versus perspective, and then of course the field of view, having a wide or a more normal or even shallow uh, field of view is super helpful. Okay, let's talk about creating an animation and the kinds of settings that you want to use inside of Cloud Compare. Now, um, I'm just going to walk through this quickly and then we'll actually go in and we'll do one and uh, we're using some kind of a model. Okay. Um, but the first thing you need to do is create a viewpoint. So basically what that means is it's a camera position and what it does is it locks the camera position and the field of view and then you move to another position and you capture another viewpoint, move to another position, capture another viewpoint. And basically what it does is it interpolates the position uh, in between the camera positions. So that's going to be useful and that's going to be helpful and I'll demonstrate that in just a little bit. Now there's some other things that you can do. So for example, there's super resolution or super sampling down here. I'm going to explain what that does, but basically it creates a really big image like larger than the monitor and then it shrinks it back down. And you may say, well, why does it do that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I'll explain why in just a minute. Here's another tip slow down the animation. A lot of people will do animations and they're moving really, really, really quick. And when you do that, when you're turning corners or you're moving around, it's just very disorienting. And for people that are watching it, it's not a good thing. Okay. So, uh, often add a bit more time to the animation. If it's an extra 10, 15, 20 seconds, it may make all the difference uh, in the world. Another feature here is going to be called smoothing or your camera path smoothing. So it has to do with the way that it interpolates from one position to the next. Okay. So, um, if I have a, uh, like a position going around a corner, so I start at one point, then I have another uh, key point or viewpoint at the corner, and then I go to a, a final position. Well, it has to do with how sharp it's going to go around that particular corner. Okay. And sharp or abrupt movements are not really all that helpful or not all that great when dealing with animation animation. So you typically want to smooth it out a little bit. And that's what some of the options are here. Frame rate, that's down here. I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about the uh, bit rate as well. Okay, so let's jump back into Cloud Compare and I'm going to go through some of this with you. Okay, so I've got my cube here again and I'm going to just use this uh, for one of the examples here and then I'll switch over to maybe like a different model or something. But let's say for example, I start on this particular corner and I want to create a viewpoint or a key point. The shortcut is going to be control V. So I'm just hitting control V and you'll see that I have a, it calls it viewport. Okay. Or key point or whatever. And, and it's over here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this other corner like this, right about there. And I'm going to create another one uh, by hitting control V. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a top down view like this. Okay, so I want to see it something like that. And I'm going to hit control V again. So basically what I have is I've got a view that's from this edge, then I move from this edge, and then I go up here. Okay, now to start the um, animation plugin, you basically need these viewpoints first, and I'm going to select them all to tell it that these are all the viewpoints I'm going to be using. So the first one, and then the third one, and then you'll see here, I've got this little, I think it's called a clapboard. Uh, people that are in the film industry might know more than me. So I'm going to click on this and this is the plugin window. And this is what we're going to be using. So I'm going to try to tuck this down here so I can see the animation a bit. And starting from here, you'll see that the total duration of the animation is 20 seconds. Uh, I can turn this down to like 15, just 10 seconds to make the example for now. And I want to talk to you about the smoothing, okay, or like smoothing between key points. And that's what I was talking about before. So if I just do a preview of this, let's see what it looks like. I'm going to go preview. You'll see that it's going around 
and now it's going to go to this edge and then it's going to move up so it's there and you see there's a nice little smooth transition a little bit of an abruptness there okay so if i turn this up just a little bit more so let me go to like point well let me try point four let's see what that does and notice the difference here so i'm going to go to preview so it's going to here and it should gradually start moving up a bit now too so okay not too abrupt a little bit smooth too okay so that's there now if i shut this off completely okay smoothing trajectory and i'm going to do this again i'm going to preview this i made a big turn between the second point and the top but watch what happens here bang a very very abrupt turn okay there's no smoothing at all and so um, those kinds of abrupt turns are not really the greatest okay when you're trying to do this so i'm going to keep this smoothing on and i'll even go back to point two i'm not going to do too much here or uh uh, make some big changes but that smoothing uh, here when we're doing point clouds or we're doing different types of models um, keep the smooth trajectory on that's that's really really helpful okay that's a good example there what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a different model because I actually want to have something in my screen here and then I'll be right back okay I'm back and I've got this skull model that I'm going to be animating using the animation plugin I'm just going to rotate around um, so usually what you should do first when you bring the model in is just have a quick look at the uh, the points and how dense they are so you see here this is pretty dense right it's not too bad but you can see all these little specks right these are the, uh, the this is the point data and if I was to get really close to this model you'll see it starts to break up okay so as I move around it okay like this I can kind of see through it and that has to do with the point size now in um, in cloud compare here if you float your mouse up on the top left of the viewpoint you see it says default point size if I click on this You'll see now it starts to become more solid and I can't actually see through it anymore. Or if I make it small, okay, I'm going to get the smallest size that it has and I zoom out enough, it looks solid. So it's always a balance between how close you are and then how large you make the point sizes. So let's say I'm just going to visualize it something like this. You'll see it starts to break apart. Okay, so I'm not going to get much closer than this. Uh, if I float up here and I go one, you see that it doesn't look too bad. Okay, so this is pretty good it looks solid i can't see through really uh, unless i were to get much closer so that's a good start also the background here so if i want to change the background it's this first setting up here in cloud compare i'm just going to click on that and it says color and materials at the top okay so here it says colors the background is black if i click on display gradient and i go apply okay oh it will should change it let me hit okay no actually it's not doing that right now let's try that again if i click on this and i go colors and i go to background uh, i gotta hit this a bit uh let's see if i change that up a bit i go okay a gradient okay there we go so pure black it's it's not going to work you see it goes from here to here okay but i like pure black so i'm just going to change that back again um, i'm not going to use the gradient so make sure that's unchecked hit apply and go okay so that's what I'm gonna live with so I got my point size I got my background now I want to check my field of view on the camera so I'm gonna go here I'm at 50 so let's say I turn this up to 90 and now I zoom in you see how it's a lot more uh, the part that's in front of me is sort of really getting some uh, perspective and some bending so this may not be what you want okay this may not be the kind of thing you want I like 50 in cloud compare it's a pretty safe number to use uh, but let me exaggerate this even a little bit more okay so let me go to 120 and then you'll get the idea so you see here now now it starts to look a little weird see how the chin is really sticking out and it just doesn't look even circular okay this is not something we would want to use for this particular animation so let me go back to what we had before but this is just a good example so i'm going to go back to 50 hit ok i'm going to zoom back to my position and i think i'm in good shape here all right so i think what i'll do is i'm just going to go through uh, maybe starting like from this side and then we'll get to the other side so i'm going to set up my first position and once I'm happy with this, I'm going to hit Control V, and that gives me my first viewpoint. Now I had some leftovers here, so it's starting on number four, no big deal. And then I'm going to go to the front. And it's really important to take small steps, okay? Uh, what I don't want to do is, let's say, for example, this is maybe a good example. I'll just take two. Okay, so I've got one viewpoint that was on this side, and I've got another one that's on this side. So if you're thinking that it's going to like really blend nicely between the two, let's see what happens if we do this. So I'm going to select the two. 
just by holding down the shift key. I'm going to bring in the animation plugin and let's just do a quick preview just to see what happens. I'm going to go, I'm going to say, yep, yeah, give me a preview. And let's see if it blends nicely between the two. It's not too bad. Actually, it's better than I thought it would be. Let me just have a look here. In fact, I'm going to speed this up. I don't want to be waiting that. I'm just going to say 10 seconds is fine. And let's preview. Okay, like this. Okay, that time we kind of got lucky. Okay, because it actually rotated it around the same position. But let me try something here and let's see if I can kind of uh, do something different. So I'm going to go cancel. I'm going to delete the second one here. And another thing you can do if you go to viewpoint and you want to go to apply, okay, it'll jump back to that position like right here. But let's say, for example, I go here and I'm going to rotate around this way. Let's see what it does. Just like that. And I'm going to create a new viewpoint. Let's take these two and see what happens here. I'm going to move this off. It's starting in uh, the first position. Go preview. And you can see that it gradually uh, goes to the other side. So it's not too bad. But let's say, for example, right, maybe I wanted to get more of this side. Well, if you only have two points, it's going to interpolate between the two. And so maybe it doesn't exactly turn the way that you want to. So having more viewpoints are going to be helpful. Okay. So that's something that I would say. So let me start over and delete this one. I'm going to rotate here because I want it to go here. Maybe I want to zoom in a bit. And then I'm going to go control V. I'm going to go this way like that. I'm going to go control V again. And then I'll just go here and maybe I'll, I want to zoom in a little bit on the top like this and control V. And that's good for me. Cool. All right, let's take these four and I'm going to go to animate. And I'm first thing I always do is a little preview. I'm just going to say, Hey, what does this look like for me? And it defaults here to about 20 seconds, which is fine. I'll just sit through it and watch it. Make sure it's not doing anything funny. I have the smoothing on, which is great. And uh, yeah, this looks fine for me. I'm not going to get too, uh, too out of whack. I am clipping a little bit of the bottom. I could zoom out a little bit in some of these positions. So let's say, for example, I actually want to do that. I'll update one of the positions. So if I go to position seven and I go apply, maybe this is too close here. So maybe I want to zoom out a bit like that. And I'm going to go update. And then I'm going to go to eight. I'm going to apply. Maybe that's a little bit too close. I'm going to zoom out a bit like this. And I'm going to go update. And let me just check number nine. I'm going to apply. And yeah, let me move this a bit and zoom out just a tiny bit. And I'm going to go update. So you can go back to these and change them. No problem. And hopefully that's a good tip there. All right, let's do this again. I'm going to go back here to the plugin. Now, in this case, um, it is automatically uh, interpolating the steps or the time. So if I click here, you'll see I've got 7.72. If I click here, I got 6.56. Okay, so I could change that so they have an equal spacing. So if I go to the beginning and just uncheck automatic, and maybe I just want to set five seconds here on this next one, I want to I want to set five, right? And then on this one, maybe I want to do five as well. Well, that's obviously going to change the timing. In this case, it may not have that big of a difference. Um, but that is possible. I'm going to stick with automatic for now. And I'm going to leave it at uh, I'm going to leave it at 15 seconds. Okay. And you'll see it actually kept what I had before. No problem. Now this smooth trajectory I've already shown you, I'm going to leave that on no problem, but let's start getting into some of the other settings that are down here. So one of them has to do with the frame rate. So uh, 30 frames per second is pretty good. That's a good number to stick with. If you want it to look a little bit smoother for whatever reason, you can bump that up to 60. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh, but usually 30 is going to be absolutely fine. Bit rate though is a little different. Okay. So on the bit rate, if you're going to be rendering out an animation that is uh, pretty much full screen or like HD, so 1920 by 1080, you're going to want this up at about 5,000 um, kilobytes per second. Okay. About 5,000. Now what I did was I actually did this before and I want to show you the difference. So there's two animations. One was done at a hundred kilobytes per second. Another one was done at 5,000. And if I show these to you, let me just bring these up. Okay, so the first animation here was done at 5,000 uh, kilobytes per second. And I'll just let it come up here on the screen so you can see it. And it looks really good. Uh, it looks uh, decent, right? The image quality is pretty good. So no problem there. And uh, the file size here is about 13 megabytes for this uh, short animation, right? It's about 20 seconds or so.
Now let me show you the other one. So this one was done at 100 megabits per second. Okay, so look at this one. And you will quickly notice that this does not look any good at all. It's completely, completely pixelated. And so the image quality, the compression is way, way too high. So keep that in mind. If you're doing 5,000, 6,000 kilobits per second, that's pretty good. It will make your file size go up a little bit, but who cares? If you're putting this online or whatever uh, on YouTube, it's going to end up being compressed anyway, but you at least want to start with a decent um, resolution or whatever. So you don't want to turn this uh, too low or make it too small. So that's the difference between the kilobytes per second. Now I need to show you this one here, this super resolution. Actually, let me change this back. I want to go back to uh, 5,000 here. That's good. And I'm going to show you the difference here. So this is super resolution and we're going to see if we can tell the difference. So what this is going to do is it's going to render out the image larger in the background. And this is helpful when you have point cloud data. And the reason is if you imagine an image or that is four times the size and you have one point, that point may show up as one pixel, one or two pixels, something like that. And so if you have a lot of little stray points, they show up as one pixel when it's really, really large. Now, when you shrink it back down to normal size three or four times, that little pixel just disappears. Okay, so these little stray points of noise, they kind of disappear. And it also helps with a flickering effect that you will often see with uh, point cloud data. And so actually, let me bring that one up again. Uh, the 5,000 uh, uh, kilobits per second here. So I don't know if you, you can probably see this in the video, but up, up on the top of the skull and some other places, you can see just a tiny bit of flickering. We're going to see if we can improve on that using super resolution. So let me jump out of this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing, leave it the same. And I'm going to do, uh, I had this set on one before, but now we're going to call this SR4 for super resolution. So I'm going to crank this up as much as possible. So in the background, it's going to render it larger and then make it smaller. So let me render this out. And then while it's doing that, I'll come back uh, once we are done. Okay, so we have just finished rendering that out. Um, I think I'm going to close this for now. And what I'll do is just to refresh your memories, I'm going to bring up the Skull 5000. So this was the original one where we just used a sub uh, super sampling of one. And you can see the flickering that's up here and uh, across here. So in some other areas. Now, if I bring open the other one, so this was done with a setting of four, you're going to see that it's almost gone. Okay, so that's super sampling setting when you have a point cloud or point cloud settings, crank it up there and let it go. Now, I will say this, it took about four times as long to render. So I was waiting here a little bit um, because it's just, it's doing a lot more in the background, but the end result is definitely well worth it. So uh, that's a, a keeper for sure. So keep that in mind whenever you're rendering these out and it will help you significantly. Okay, so another thing that I'll just talk about here in a second is the loop option. So it is possible to make a video that loops. And so if I was moving around the skull or a car or a building from the outside, whatever it might be, I can basically close the loop. So wherever I finish off, which is my last viewpoint, it'll try to jump back to the first one again. Now this will change the animation a little bit uh, because it's trying to make a nice smooth curve. But let me show you what happens here. So I'm just going to use the four that I have. I'm going to click on loop. You see it jumped a little bit. So it had to make an adjustment. But let's see what it looks like as a preview starting from the first First key point here. So you see actually how it went the other way a little bit. Well, it had to put that in there in order to smoothly transition. So we're going to the side and then we have to go up to the top a little bit and then we're going to return back to the first position. So you see now it's kind of like turning back. So if I render this out now and let's see where it ends up with here. Okay, so if I were to render this out, this would be a nice smooth looping uh, video. So uh, even though I didn't go all the way around. So let's just try that. Now I'm going to render this out and I'm just going to change the name here so that it's called loop. Uh, I'll call it skull loop. It loop is on and I'm just going to go ahead and go to uh, render this out. And once that's done, we're going to come right back and I'll have you look at what it looks like. Okay, so that's done. So I'm going to bring open the uh, skull loop file here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to repeat. 
Okay, so we'll see what happens. Now, sometimes in the software here or uh, in the, the player that I have, it may there may be a little jump when it tries to repeat, but usually when you have it just set in other software, it'll be nice and smooth. So if you look here, it's getting back to about the point. Let's see if it does a little jump. Should probably, yeah, it does a little, there's a little pause and then it starts it again. But the end point of the video and the start point of the video have a smooth transition. They're in the same spot. And so this is helpful uh, if you just want to have a video that's continually, continually playing in the background in a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. Just have the loop turned on. And of course here, I did kind of a funny pattern or whatever, but it's always best if you put the viewpoints yourself and have the last viewpoint close to the first one. And this way the transition be between the two is fairly natural. So that's pretty much it. Uh, a few other little things here. Of course, you can name the point cloud and I'm having a little, uh, uh, glitch here and it could just be because uh, the animation plugin was recently updated but you need to include the extension here at the moment and maybe that's just a little bug or something like that uh, also there are many different types of formats here if you scroll down there's a ton of different things that you can export and so you can always give that a try uh, mp4 seems to be pretty good a pretty standard so but if you need to change it to something else you can go ahead and give that a go also you can export the frames so people that do video editing and such you can always uh, export Export the individual frames and then have more control over what you want to do with the uh, with the video in something like Premiere Pro or a different program. So that does it for this episode of Click 3D. Hope you enjoy the uh, animation plugin in Cloud Compare. It's a great option and it's free. It's open source. So uh, go ahead. You can always download it and give it a go. Thanks a lot, folks. Take care, and we'll see you next time on Click 3D. Bye bye.